stress. Fundamentally, we just cannot wait for the, for the next person to have a eureka moment and come up with an idea that would uh, help us accelerate problem solving around some of these grand challenges. So Ron and I embarked on this journey, which has become our life mission, to build a machine that can focus on ideation, that can read the web, understand how the world works, connect the dots, and collaborate with humans in order to enable a new, a new form, a new generation uh, of problem solving. And this is quite a unique application of AI that goes beyond prediction or understanding data or analyzing data with this core focus on problem solving. In order to achieve this, we actually had to go very deep into understanding the fundamental limitations of human problem solving and human ideation. Indeed. So let's understand what are we waiting for? Why is it taking us so long? And one of the root causes is the challenges in ideation. Um, the, the first thing that uh, comes to mind is why does it take such a, su such a long period between disruption moments? Uh, these, these rare moments uh, where we understand that something we've been working on for uh, 10 years is related to another problem. Um, and a, a breakthrough happens. Uh, researchers need to uh, get free of their individual and collective biases and come up with frameworks that simply contradict what they've been used to. This is when new ideas um, start, start a revolution. And of course, there is the uh, throughput issue. Uh, look how long it takes to, uh, to convey two simple ideas. Uh, if we need to go through millions of such ideas before we get the right one, uh, this is definitely an obstacle. So when we finally come up with, right, with the right ideas, we need to validate them. We need to test them against what we've known before. This is where we apply, uh, apply those hypotheses to data, and we, and we see which ones actually hold and which ones we need to throw to the basket and uh, go back to the whiteboard. Another problem with uh, data is that it doesn't come in a flat file uh, where we can just run one of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, deep learning or other machine learning algorithms and get the solution. Complex systems have uh, data associated with different facets of the problems. Let's take an example. Uh, if we think of uh, global warming, uh, one of the existential challenges uh, we're facing, so it's connected to the greenhouse effect uh, which uh, is also caused by air pollution. Uh, we have nature um, uh, offering us the rainforests, but we're, uh, we're fighting nature and we're um, uh, causing fires and, um, and aggressive agriculture, reducing the amount of uh, rainforests uh, in, in the world, and so on. Each of these come with uh, data sets. And it's an enormous challenge to traverse this uh, potentially almost infinite uh, space of uh, path to connect all these uh, data sets and come up with the right hypothesis. And the data tells us only the bottom up, the inductive uh, part of the, uh, of the story. When ver very often when we have a good idea, and uh, we, want to, we want to use data to validate it, that data doesn't exist. Just think of uh, a solution that uh, we've just invented, and the first data points will come when we finish building the solution. We can't afford uh, that process. We cannot afford uh, waiting for the data and only then understand that there is something wrong with what we're going to build. So this cyclic challenge um, connects us to knowledge. Um, Knowledge is the opposite. Uh, knowledge is often qualitative, sometimes also quantitative. It goes top-down and deductive. And that helps us cross the, this chasm between uh, not data that is not available to knowledge that we can uh, now use and apply reasoning. However, 
just in the, the 21st century, we've already created more knowledge and uh, information than, uh, the entire, uh, than during the entire history of humanity. Uh, so this uh, immense overload is challenging. There is no single person that understands everything and knows about all the research that was done in their domain. Uh, not, not to mention the fact that cross-domain uh, is uh, perhaps the, the, the best catalysator of innovation and inventions in the, in the last two, two centuries. Finally, uh, there's the knowledge to ideation chasm. We need to come with new knowledge. And coming up with that new knowledge requires that we, that we generate inventions. And this is the challenge we're facing. We need machines to help us with creating these inventions. If, if we look here, we need machines that will be able to connect the dots at the rate of uh, millions of hypotheses per minute and uh, organize all the information that we uh, fetch from the web in a, in a knowledge graph, apply ideation principles, and come up with new ideas, new solutions, and connect them to the unmet needs. This process uh, is, is at the core of what uh, Sagi and I started six years ago. And the best way to recognize the potential of having machines and humans work together, having the humans set up the challenges and at the same time machines come up with ideas and let us not only participate as drivers for this process, but also as participants, as reviewers of the ideas, um, filtering of the good ones and eventually uh, confirming the path to new solutions. Let's see it in action. All right, so one of those challenges is sustainable agriculture, right, which is linked to the 17 uh, sustainability uh, goals that uh, the UN has set. So let's start with this challenge of sustainable agriculture and ask the web, ask the machine, what are the different factors that could influence sustainable agriculture? Right. So the first question that we are going to ask is, what are the factors that negatively influence it, whether it's based uh, on research publications or patents or news or the entire web. So by running this, the machine actually starts coming up with the first uh, results, the first ideas. For example, soil erosion, soil salinity, climate change, nickel mining, drought, deforestation are different factors that emerged here. We see that in different places around the world, there are different themes that emerge. For example, deforestation is very strong in, uh, uh, in uh, Brazil. Climate volatility and, uh, and food deficits here in the sub-Saharan area and nickel mining here in the Philippines. After understanding some of the root causes, we actually want to understand their relative importance. And this is exactly where overlaying data on top of knowledge can help. So if, for example, we take low yield, which is one of the factors here, and ask a simple question. What can help us increase the yield? Right, again, by running this autonomous research against the web, we see that fertilizer came up as one of the ideas, one of the, the ways to increase uh, the yield. We can then link it to a repository of 1.2 million data sets. One of these is, for example, the fertilizer consumption uh, in Oman, as well as in other countries. And same thing we have for the low yield. This is a data set of cereal yield in kilograms per hectare. After having a data set for each one of them, we can actually use one of them as the dependent variable, the other one as the independent, and run our hypothesis engine to start discovering the actual patterns that would link those, those two, and therefore actually moving from the uh, qualitative uh, analysis to the quantitative. Let's pause for a second and uh, see what's going to happen under the hood. Uh, the first thing is creating a, an automated data pipeline uh, that will allow us building a model. And then, before building the model, uh, the machine is going to uh, automatically generate the, the right hypothesis and surface them up. Mm. In fact, uh, Guy is uh, going to drill down into that in one of the uh, subsequent sessions. All right. So essentially what we see here is the different data sets that, uh, uh, that the machine uses. In this case, this is our serial yield 
uh, data set, this is a soil enrichment data set, and then these actually go into the hypothesis engine, which you see here below, and it started coming up with those patterns. The first one is by traversing Wikipedia, it found that, uh, that whenever the country is related to countries in Africa, that almost triples the likelihood of low yield. We also see that the minimal value of the nitrogen usage in this country in the last 20 years correlates, or the population density, which may also come from the info boxes on Wikipedia, is also link linked to this. If we zoom out and go back to our qualitative part, it's interesting to see what can help us reduce soil erosion and soil salinity, for example. So let's ask it this question. So now it's running. We like the adrenaline of live demos. <laughs> and uh, what we are going to see in a few seconds, under optimistic assumptions, uh, is the fact that, uh, that uh, compost actually helps us both with soil erosion and uh, soil salinity. We also see that biochar emerged here as a factor. Uh, and interestingly, we see that, uh, that for biochar, uh, there is a trend. So we are asking the question of, uh, of uh, uh, is it new, is it training, is it growing, is, it, is there a certain momentum? We see that uh, one decade ago, there was around one publication uh, around biochar. But one decade later, right uh, now, in 2018, uh, uh, there are already 64. We see the top companies that generate IP. Uh, we see different market size analysis for, uh, for biochar. And sometimes these would not agree, so we want to see the distribution, as well as understanding where the hotspots uh, of, uh, of innovation and application uh, and implementation of biochar are. So we see that Ghana actually emerged as one of the, of the hotspots. But can we take it one step further? Can we actually go beyond uh, mining the web and understanding uh, 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 existing knowledge about our problem and then overlaying data, running our hypothesis search in order to, to extract additional knowledge from, uh, from data? Can we actually have the machine come up with completely novel inventions? So if you heard uh, the talk of uh, Daphna Shachaf yesterday, we see that we can actually learn from, uh, from past inventions and extract so certain universal principles that could help us apply AI to accelerate the innovation processes. So a similar uh, principle actually works here. So let's ask the machine to help us come up with inventions here. Let's run it. So before the machine was looking for existing knowledge and connecting the dots, now we're trying to apply things that are not written anywhere. Yeah. So essentially what we want to do is, uh, is to extract some of these universal inventive principles from past inventions, but then we know that machines uh, actually are going to be very good at coming up with half-baked ideas. So the idea that, uh, that we apply here is using, combining this or coupling this with humans and let humans do what they do best, criticize, right? Uh, and uh, by enabling di this dialogue between the man and the machine, uh, we can gradually refine the ideas. So let's try it live. And let's run it. And here we see the machine, let me zoom in, starting to come up with uh, half-baked ideas. So can we change the color of the pesticide? Huh, maybe that could allow us to, to make the pesticide more visible and uh, then use, for example, drones with computer vision to, uh, to optimize the deployment of per pesticide. Right? Or alternatively, uh, turning the irrigation upside down. What does it mean, right? Can irrigation come from a different direction? Uh, making the land mobile, right? Or using centrifugal force during harvest. So can we actually put each, each one of the, of the trees, right, fruit trees uh, on a plate and spin it and put a net around it and have sub-second uh, uh, harvest of fruit? I don't know, right? So this dialogue essentially is, uh, is what we see here. If you uh, Google for, for this uh, sentence, you will not find it. It's actually generated uh, uh, dynamically. If I hit yes, I can say my brilliant idea is etc. Then once I submit it, it actually all starts uh, appearing here. So this is this collaborative process uh, of uh, humans uh, and machines. We already start seeing the, the early results of, uh, uh, of this crowdsourcing process that, uh, that uh, appears here, right? So that's a, a small example. 
what you've seen is an example of, uh, of harnessing humanity's collective intelligence, which could be computational intelligence, right? By combining computational building blocks to form hypotheses and test them against the data. It could be web intelligence where the machine can read the web and come up with uh, uh, ways to connect the dots. And it could be human intelligence to go beyond the existing knowledge that is captured on the web. So this is what we do when we partner with leading companies in order to scale this impact uh, uh, across a broad range of problems, but many of them are focused around sustainability. And there is an interesting link between business impact and social impact here. But this mission is too big for us to be able to, to undertake uh, by, uh, on our own. So we need all the help that we can get, and we would like to invite you to join us and partner with us. So talk to us at our booth eight, and thank you. <laughs>